Sometimes on this journey I get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness Is a canvas for your strength And my story isn't over My story's just begun And failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does Yeah, failure won't define me that's what my father does Ooh, lay your burdens down Ooh, here in the Father's house Check your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house Not the end game The journey is where you are You never wanted perfect You just wanted my heart And the story isn't over If the story isn't good And failure's never final When the father's in the room And failure's never final When the father's in the room
every voice now home in glory your face i'll see my pain no more my fear will cease i bow my life i fix my eyes on christ my king i bow my life i fix my eyes on christ my Hi, welcome back to Rabbit Creek's online campus. I'm Josh, the worship and the outreach pastor at Rabbit Creek Church, and I'm again joined by Stephanie and Drew, two of our worship leaders. And it is awesome that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. One of the things I'd like to ask you to do is if that you would take just a moment and either share the link if you're watching this on YouTube or that you would share this on your Facebook feed, like us and follow us there, and you can also follow us on Instagram, and that will help us be connected with the people that are in your circles and be able to share the love of Christ and the worship that we get to take part of as a part of Rabbit Creek Church at home uh, with the people that are in your life and that are important to you. So go ahead and do that for just a minute, and then let's kick off with the song, Never Once. Standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us, kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way. But with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say, never once did we ever walk alone, never once did you leave us on our own, you are faithful, God, you are 
for every step in the midst of a global pandemic, in the midst of political decisions that we like and political decisions that we don't like, in the midst of daily struggles and daily successes, we know that we have never been alone when we've put our hope and our trust in you. That scripture tells us that the peace which surpasses all understanding comes when we lean into you, God, when we trust into you and when we rely in you. God, would you continue to lead us? Would you continue to give us your hope and your peace as we know that you've been with us always? We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, a couple of quick announcements that we normally have for you. is One, I'd like you to pull out your phone if you don't have it yet and download the Church Center app. You can use the Google Play Store to do that. You can also use the App Store if you're using an Apple device. And two of the main ways that you can stay connected to Rabbit Creek Church through that app is, one, through your tithes and offering. If you're a regular part of Rabbit Creek, whether here online or when we were meeting in person, also you can use that to check in with events. And one of the events that took place last week was that Pastor Corey met with our student ministry parents to engage with them on how we can best disciple and help them disciple their students as a part of Rabbit Creek Church going into the fall of 2020. And if you miss that, there is going to be some important information coming out soon that would help you as you lead your students. And you can reach out to him at Corey at rabbitcreekchurch.org to get that info. And you can continue to check in on Facebook and with the church office if you have questions on that. We'd be happy to connect you with him to make sure that you're able to do the best job that you can in discipling your student. You can also check in with Pastor Lori for upcoming events on our children's uh, ministry that she runs. And you can do that with Lori at rabbitcreekchurch.org as well. But the other thing, again, that I need you to do is I need you to share this with the people that you are in contact with on your social media feeds, and that will help us to continue to spread the love of Jesus and to continue to minister to people through song and through preaching like we do every week at Rabbit Creek Church Online. But he brought me all of his love.
You don't always get to see it, but we get to sit around when we do this and really mess up a lot of songs and genuinely just struggle together as a team. And on Sundays when we're doing this back at the Hillside and the Helping Campus, it's just on a larger scale. But thanks for being with us and allowing us just to be real and to be authentic with you as we worship the King that loves us. And he is the one that gives us our identity. That Jesus loving us is what actually gives us worth. Making us in his image is what gives us value. It's not in how well we sing or how well we can play an instrument or how well we can be a part of a church. It's really in what Jesus has done for us and who he has created us to be. That when we see walls continuing to be built up in front of us that we can't overcome, we know that he is still there walking alongside us and loving us and seeing us through all of the things that this life can bring in difficulty and in struggles. Drew, I don't know about you, but there's been things in life that I was just continuing to wait for God to move, and it seemed like he just didn't. Mountains and obstacles that I wanted gone, but he saw fit to leave there in front of me for me to continue to have to work and to climb. And for me, that's what this song is about. Yeah. 
a good friend of mine that challenged me on that song, Drew, about two years ago. He said, well, God's never going to fail me. And I said, this song is about declaring what we know God to have always done so that we can rely on what he's always going to do for us, and that is that he will never fail. Thanks. As Pastor Mark talks today, uh, the Gospel of Mark, I'd like you to think and to sit and listen to the goodness of God poured out through the mercies that Jesus showed to those that he loved while he was here and continues to love you in that same way. Good morning. We're going to go back to the Gospel of Mark today as we continue going through Mark's telling of the life of Jesus. He does so in a very succinct manner, and it's one that is manageable for us. As we want to look at all the Gospels, we focus during this series upon Mark because he jumps right in to the meat of Jesus' ministry, to the story of what Jesus came to do, how he did it, and what was the result of Jesus' actions. To bring us to our text this morning, I first want to introduce you to some words from Edith Dean. Edith Dean wrote a wonderful book many years ago called All of the Women of the Bible. And as the book's title suggests, she goes through some in very short sentence form and some in pages worth of form, talking about women that are mentioned in the Bible. In fact, every woman mentioned. Now, the woman that we're going to encounter today in the story that Mark tells is not given a name. She certainly had one, but Mark did not find it necessary to give us her name. In one gospel, she's referred to as a Canaanite, that is one of Canaanite descent. Uh, we find her as the uh, woman of Sir, uh, Syrian descent, uh, Phoenician descent. Uh, we see her as a Greek. We're going to see these descriptions of this woman as far as her origin, her family background. Edithine adds to the description of this wonderful story, this woman found in Mark and Dean writes, by culture and language, this woman was Greek. By religion, a pagan. By position in her community, a nobody. We're going to think about this, this Greek, this pagan, this nobody. Now, this story, as we go into it, may catch you off guard. Perhaps you've heard it before and given it a little thought. Or perhaps you've heard it and it's been puzzling you. And you're wondering why this particular passage is in Mark's gospel. It surprises us because Jesus' response to this woman's request. It's not one that we would anticipate Jesus would give. We think of Jesus, rightly so, as all-powerful, all-gracious, one who has great love and concern. And indeed, we're going to talk about Jesus' mercies today, but his initial response is going to catch us off guard. It's one of the more difficult passages of Scripture because, again, it surprises us, particularly Jesus' response to her request. The background is here's a woman who is outside of the normal group that Jesus is reaching, and she has a situation. She has a daughter, and we're going to hear about that situation in Mark chapter 7, beginning in verse 24. So Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. And he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, 
a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syria and Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her. For it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. As, as we encounter that passage, we think of ways in which we are surprised. Uh, here's a woman who is a Gentile, a Greek, a non-Jew in other words, who has a request of Jesus. It's a quest that is very similar to one we've heard earlier. That of a child in need and a parent coming to, to speak up on the child's behalf. The interesting twist, the difference here is, as I've said, this woman is Greek or Gentile, non-Jew. And so Jesus comes back with a response. And his response is, in essence, this. I have children to feed, and they are the priority. Dogs, not so much. Now, when people look at this passage, there are usually four explanations given. One is that Jesus is speaking with somewhat of a twinkle in his eye. In other words, somewhat of a joke, somewhat of a jest sort of comment as he, he speaks to this woman, telling her in a humorous way that he has a priority, but he's willing to reach outside that priority. There's another theory, and that is that this is a test for the disciples. The disciples who are witnessing this, what are they going to think about the Lord? Are they going to run and go the other way because Jesus is being, from first perspective, rude to this woman? Third, there's the opinion that here he is testing the woman. Will she take her pride and walk away, or will she respond in a type of humility that suggests her devotion? And the fourth understanding is that possibly Jesus' use of the word here can be applied to our version of what would be a puppy, in other words, a cute dog. But as David Garland states it, he says, but a dog is a dog. Whether it's a pampered household pet or a street cur, most would not understand the epithet as a term of endearment, whether Jesus spoke it kindly or not. In other words, most of us, when we look at this passage, would not think that Jesus is being kind when he is equivocating this woman and her people to dogs and the Jews and their entire people as his children. So what do we do with a passage like this? And why in the world would I be choosing this passage when I'm talking about the mercies of God? Why would this passage speak to the mercies of Jesus? Maybe it's surprising to us. But I want us to dig into the story because it is one in which we can find the great mercy of God. There is an additional part to the story included in Matthew that Mark does not include. I think it's helpful for us to look at these Gospels. The three of the Gospels are known as synoptic Gospels, a word meaning the same. In other words, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are in many ways using the source Mark and other sources and also agreeing with each other in the way they're telling the story. And here Matthew adds to what Mark has to say. And in Matthew chapter 15, verse 24, it says, He answered, this is in the same conversation with the Syrophoenician woman, the Greek woman from Syria, Phoenicia. It says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now notice that you hear that word only. When I read that, my, my mouth wants to formulate the word first rather than only. I came first for Israel. Uh, but the word there is only. And what are we to do with this? We understand, according to John chapter 3, that Jesus came on behalf of the world because God so loved the world. And that we see throughout the story of the whole entirety of God's message is that he came to redeem not only Israel, but all people who've come to him. God came to save people in general. And so what are we supposed to do with this when Matthew says that Jesus said, I came only for 
the Jews, only for the people of Israel. In many ways, it's a chronological statement. As we read the Gospels and then move further into the, the book of Acts, which is actually the Acts of the Apostles, those who are carrying on Jesus' message, we see that there is a time and a place, a perfect time, in which the Gospel is going to spread out from the Jews into the Gentiles. We see this most clearly in the Council of Acts where they begin to talk about what are the requirements of being a Christian. Is it going to be following down the, the stricter Jewish understanding or is it going to be more open to all people? And ultimately it's open to all people, Jew and Gentile alike. Paul indeed will say there's no, neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, but all in Christ Jesus. So clearly Jesus came only for the Jews is a chronological statement, not an ultimate statement. But nevertheless, here at this point, when Jesus is speaking to a non-Jew, Matthew records that Jesus says, I've come only for the Jew. In other words, it's not your time yet. It's not your time yet. Therefore, I have come to feed my children, and certainly there will be leftovers, uh, but these are not for you. These are for the Jews. I've come to feed the Jews. And let's go back to the story. In chapter 7, verse 24, it says, Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, but he could not keep his presence secret. So we pause in verse 24 there for just a moment and realize again that Jesus' ministry is getting going. And this is what Mark likes to do is keep the story moving. And what he's telling us here is that Jesus has an ultimate plan and a perfect timing. And he's not ready yet for the main event to take place. That main event being his ultimate crucifixion and resurrection. He had some things to do before then, and so he's trying to lay, lay low a little bit. He's still doing the ministry, but he wants to keep private. But this is not very easy to do when he's done what he already has done, he's displayed his power and been so gracious to people. And so this unnamed woman, yet significant woman, uh, finds out, and she is bold and goes directly to him. You pick up in verse 25. In fact, as soon, in other words, instant instantaneously, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. There, in my Bible, is a little white space between verse 26 and 27. In that white space, there's a pause. In that white space... It gives us time to take some wondering moments. We don't want to wander too far from the story, but we do want to wonder. We want to think about what was Jesus going to say. If we're new to the story, we are going to anticipate a statement of Jesus. We're going to be surprised that what we think he's going to say is not what he says at all. We're going to wonder there about how the woman is ready to receive. She has immediately gone to Jesus, and she has begged and she has pleaded in the sense of this is urgent Jesus this this is the, the the mama bear this this is the pleading parent please take care of my child please protect my child this is the one who's saying please help and to this we may think that Jesus will say one thing but what does he say verse 27 first let the little children eat all they want for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. As we think about this response again, we notice that the word first is there in Mark's account. Remember that Matthew said only. And so as we compare the, gosp compare the Gospels, we understand that Matthew is heading toward the chronological event. But Mark's already there in many ways. He's saying, Jesus is saying first. These aren't contradictory statements. This is Jesus saying, first I've come for this. And Matthew hears him saying only for the Jews. And there is a shared understanding that ultimately this will be a broader invitation. But at this moment, according to Mark, Jesus says, first, I've come to feed my children. And it's not appropriate for me to take away from my children to feed dogs. Again, whether this is in jest, whether this is a test, whether it's the word equivalent to puppy versus some kind of mangy mutt, uh, we don't know. We still have questions. But we do understand the heart of the story. 
The heart of the story is this woman who desperately wants to help her child comes to Jesus and asks him to help. Now keep in mind, as Dean pointed out and others point out, that this woman was pagan by religion. Pagan, pagan being there, not corrupt, but pagan being not true worship of the one true God. We think the word pagan always stands for someone who is just putrid or um, un, unkind and nasty in all their ways. But that's not really what the word pagan originally means. It's just one off outside the true nature of the loving God, one who's worshiping the one true God. And this woman uh, was that pagan person. But let's think of a few ways in which this woman was an outsider. Uh, one is culture. Uh, she is a person outside the Jewish culture. Uh, one is geography. Uh, she is a woman outside of the area of Israel. In fact, William Lane points this out. It says, Jesus' trip to Tyre was apparently his only excursion beyond the ancient borders of Israel. And throughout his ministry, he avoided having much contact with Gentiles. Notice that only excursion beyond the ancient borders of Israel. We need to pay attention to this word by Lane that helps us understand this is a very unique situation. As a, as a fan of the ordinary everyday life, this is not an ordinary, ordinary everyday event. Jesus is going outside of his ordinary. Jesus is going outside of his norm. Jesus' ministry was contained by where his feet could take him. And he was always intentional about where he walked. And this is a moment where he goes a different direction, reminds us of the Samaritan story. But here is a woman much on the outside of Israel territory, and apparently uh, the only event that we see him ever doing this. That's significant. Notice she calls him Lord. Now Lord, as we see in other cultures, both biblical and more modern, can refer as a as a title of respect. And so this is what we think this passage is saying here. It's a title of respect. This woman is not a believer as we would as we would define a believer. This woman is a person speaking respectfully. In other words, sir, is what she's saying versus my Lord and Savior. But sir, would you please help? Sir, would you please come to not only my daughter's rescue, but my rescue, because I love my daughter so much. Would you, would you come and do this? But then there's this religious tension in the text that we must notice. She is Canaanite, and if you're familiar with the Old Testament, the Canaanites are people of infamy. These are people who are always on the outside of what God is doing. Uh, people that are descendants of Ham, people that are descendants of those who have gone away from God's direction. Uh, we find a description of them by Raymond Brown. He says this, he says, Canaanite worship was socially destructive. Its religious acts were pornographic and sick, seriously damaging the children, creating early impressions of deity with no interest in moral behavior. It tried to dignify by the use of religious labels, depraved acts of bestiality and corruption. It had a low estimate of human life that suggested that anything was permissible, promiscuity, murder, or anything else, in order to guarantee a good crop and harvest. It ignored the highest values, both in family and in the wider community. Love, loyalty, purity, peace, and security. And encouraged the view that all these things were inferior to material prosperity, physical satisfaction, and human pleasure. A society where those things matter most is self-destructive. We see a society that is truly focused on the wrong things. Now, the reference that Brown is making is to the ancient Canaanites. We all know that people do not forget past easily. And so while the first century Canaanites may have not practiced some of the practices that the early Canaanites did, the reputation still goes with it. As a woman of Canaanite descent is a woman who is associated by public discussion as one who comes from a very corrupt people. And therefore, the Bible is emphasizing a very interesting point that here is a Canaanite, a woman that comes from a culture that is corrupt, now coming to God, Christ incarnate, Christ God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us. Now you have Canaanite culture meaning Jewish culture. You have 
anti-God culture meeting God in the flesh. This is a pivotal moment in the text. What's going to happen? This is Mark setting the reader up in a great way to understand God's understanding of where his love will be focused. There is the, the test. There is that statement of first, I'm going to feed my children, but then there's a continued conversation. And she just begs him. Notice verse 29. Then he told her, for such a reply, the reply being that even the dogs leave the crumbs, for such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And then the Bible briefly tells us the rest of the story. Mark says in verse 30, she went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. She went home, found the child laying, lying on the bed and the demon gone. In other words, she found when she went home that the exact thing she requested had been given. That this one who tested her, this one who said the unusual response, had actually granted her request, had answered her prayer, had shown love and compassion to his daughter. That this Jewish rabbi, this one who came only for the Jews or first for the Jews, is truly extending his love beyond that first audience. We're not told from Mark much else of the story. But we need to revisit her story. What is it about this woman that really speaks to us? How can we learn from this Syrophoenician woman? Well, I want us to look at some words by David Garland when he talks about the woman's attitude. And on his commentary in the text, he writes this. He says, the woman's attitude in the face of refusal is the key to this passage. In other words, her response to Jesus saying, I'm not feeding you, I'm feeding my children. I didn't come here. For the Syrophoenicians, I, I came for the Jews. Her response is key. She comes empty handed and can make no claim. She has no merit, no priority standing, nothing to commend her. Her manner is the opposite of the snippy you owe me attitude that prevails among us, among so many today. She does not argue that her case is an exception or lobby for special treatment. She does not point out that Jesus is not even the land of Israel. How can he deprive Jews of bread by helping her? On the other hand, she does not cut herself off from the miraculous power of Jesus by thinking she is too unworthy to receive anything at all. She accepts his judgment and bows down as a beggar for grace. There are some very profound words here in Garland's where he tells us that there is a response to this woman has when Jesus comes back and, and says this shocking response that her time to respond opens and she does something beautiful she says Jesus would you do this Lord would you do this sir would you please do this and his response is profoundly compassionate merciful when she does this when she requests she does not Air on either side, those sides being one, the you owe me attitude. In other words, Jesus, you're here, I heard you can do great things, and now it's my turn. I've stood in line, it's my turn. I demand this. The other side on which she could have erred, which she did not, was one where she would find herself unworthy. People in our day, perhaps you find yourself erring on one side or the other. Uh, perhaps you take salvation for granted. That you think somehow God owes you. That somehow he has the responsibility to set things right. That it's his job to clean up your life. Uh, or perhaps you're on the other side where you look back on your past and either because someone else has told you or you've lied to yourself over and over, you feel unworthy. You feel that you've done so much or avoided doing so much that God simply can't love you anymore. Notice we said both of those are sides in which you can err. Therefore, you can realize that you are wrong if you say I'm not worthy, just as you can be wrong when you say I deserve it. And this is the message that Mark is getting across in many ways to all of us as we read the story. 
where we find out that neither can we say, God, I deserve your love, nor can we say, God, I don't deserve your love. We can't say, God, you owe me, nor can we say, God, I am not worthy of what you have to give. The woman meets the response perfectly with her response. Now, I want us, as we think about that some more, to reflect on another passage of Scripture, a very brief passage that comes from the book of Wisdom, Proverbs. And there's a mention of the four-legged creatures again. There's a mention of the dog, the canine. And in this case, it's not puppy, it's not a cute dog. We picture a street dog. Uh, but you, if you have a dog, understand this too can be the case for cute puppies as well. But it also can be the case much more so than just with four-legged pets. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11. As a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. As a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat the folly. To what vomit do you tend to return? Listen closely to that question. To what vomit do you tend to return? Again, it could be on one of those sides. It could be you err on always going back to I deserve this mentality. Are you err on the fact that you think no way can God love me anymore? Please avoid those errors. But also think about those, those sins that can pull you in, those temptations, those addictions, those unhealthy relationships, the difficulty you have controlling the tongue, the difficulty you have of being wise with your money, you uh, perhaps are greedy with your money, or you are carefree with your money to the point of being foolish. Uh, perhaps you've taken parenting for granted and not poured into your children what you should have. Perhaps you've taken your parents for granted and you haven't been the child you know God wants you to be. Perhaps you take your job for granted. Uh, we don't know what each other's vomit may be one day to the next, but we understand scripture says we have a tendency to return to it because while vomit is vomit, it's at least familiar. And maybe vomiting, as disgusting as it sounds, can be comforting. This is why a dog returns to it. But we understand that there is a choice to be made. And that choice is, who am I going to be? Am I going to be a woman or a man, whichever is the case for you, where you say, I'm going to be going before God and I'm going to make this humble request? Or am I going to go too brashly or am I not going to go at all? Well, this woman chose to go. I mentioned earlier that there is a brief description by Mark that tells us about this woman's story. It simply says that she went home, she found her daughter lying in the bed, and the demon gone. Mark then, as his nature, moves on to another story. He leaves us wondering, perhaps. But Luke, the author of one of the Gospels, but also the author of the book of Acts, tells us about an interesting event much later that happens in the life of the Apostle Paul. Now, chronologically speaking, this would have been about the time that this young daughter would now be an adult and her mother perhaps still alive. So the woman making the request would be an elderly parent by this point and the young girl now an adult. And we find that something has changed. Again, this has taken place outside of Israel, outside of the area where Jesus did well over 90% of his ministry, close to 100. But the story took place, as we've seen, outside of that area, Syria and Phoenicia. And we would think that we wouldn't hear much more about this event. And indeed, we don't. We don't hear more about the woman. We don't hear more about the girl. We don't hear more about the events that took place after she went home, found her daughter lying in the bed, and the demon gone. But what we do find is that the story of Jesus continued. If we go to Acts chapter 21, we're going to find in the latter part of verse 3 and on into verse 6 something profound. Paul says, We landed in Tyre. Town should sound familiar. That's where we began this story. 
We landed in Tyree, where our ship was to unload its cargo. We sought out the disciples. Now, what's a disciple? A disciple is a man or a woman, boy or girl, that has chosen to follow in the gospel way. A person who's chosen to be a student of Jesus and his word in this day taught by the traveling teachers or apostles, teachers, Paul, Timothy, Titus, etc. So they're going to find the followers of Jesus who have been taught to follow Jesus in a place that has no religion prior to the story we found in Mark that is pleasing to God. It's all pagan religion. It's all Canaanite descendant religion. But now they're looking for disciples. There and stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us out of the city, and there on the beach we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went around the ship, aboard the ship, and they returned. Use your imagination with me, and it's not going to be much of a stretch because the proof is here in the text. The Bible tells us that Jesus encounters a woman in Tyre who is Canaanite, who is Syrian Phoenician, who is among people who do not worship Yahweh God, who do not follow in the gospel way. Yet this woman, whose life his change, the daughter's change, goes home, finds her daughter lying in bed, demon free. We can believe, as we did with the Samaritan story, if you're familiar with that, that this woman continued to tell her story. And indeed, the daughter continued to help tell her story. So that the story of what Jesus did in their lives continued to spread. Without such behavior, there is little chance they would be disciples in the area when Paul and his fellow travelers show up. And so there was evangelism took place based on experience. Here's a woman and a daughter who have been changed by Jesus physically, emotionally, spiritually. And they now tell the story. And we know they tell the story because we see their disciples. And, and the Bible says all of them. So there's a group of them that are sending Paul off on his next journey with greeting and love and support and prayer. They, they kneel on the beach and pray. In my mind, I, like, I love to picture the, the girl now grown up praying next to the Apostle Paul. I like to picture the mother, perhaps bent with age, but crinkled face with smiles, who is right there praying with Paul, knowing that he too was changed by Jesus. And now these three changed by Jesus, surrounded by all who were changed by Jesus, are now continuing the ministry of Jesus. We go back to one of the accounts of Jesus encountering this woman. He says this. He says, woman, you have great faith. Woman, you have great faith. I want to challenge us with that passage today that we would have great faith. That if you've known Jesus for a long time, that you'd remember that we all come as beggars before grace. And just be thankful and humble. If you have felt too unworthy to come to Jesus, have great faith that God loves you regardless of your culture, regardless of your gender, regardless of who your parents were and what your upbringing was, regardless of what you've done and have not done. God loves you. And the way to receive his love is, as the woman, to come before him and say, Lord, please help. And his response may surprise us. We may hear a few things we don't even like to hear and have a lot of questions afterwards. But ultimately, he comes to that point where he says, I'm here to help. I'm here to help. And Jesus is here to help. And I want you to reach out for him. So I encourage you, as we close out our time together here online, that you continue your time with God. I do that by getting back to the Gospel of Mark, read ahead for next week, but also spend time here right now in this story of the Syrophoenician woman because it will impact your life greatly. Thank you so much for watching, watching and have a great day. Remembering to have great faith in the merciful God. 
Because all avocado toast is die for me. Mm. We keep saying it. We keep talking it up. And it's so true. We're not lying. If you haven't been to Bloom, this is called the Green Millennial. You don't have to be a millennial to enjoy it. Mm. It's amazing. It's delicious. One second. Alright, we're good. Huh. I think we can start the video now. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Good morning, Rabbit Crew morning. Shirts. Thank you for joining us mm -hmm. today with this lovely callback. Um, <laughs> it looks good. Thank you. It really does. Thank you for joining us, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook Live. We really appreciate you being here, and we're excited to have you. Oh, Videos. is it me? Yeah. Oh, it's me. Okay. Video. Yeah. So, um, if you have a child uh, that is usually with Lori on Sunday mornings, um, Lori has a video for you every Sunday morning the same time the service airs, so 9.30 a.m. Um, and that video contains a kid version of Mark's sermon mm -hmm. um, so that they, they can digest it. Um, and that goes live every single Sunday morning right before the service or right when the service starts. Yeah, and yeah. if you're a teenager, you should be seeing a notification on your YouTube as well. Every Sunday, Corey and I, um, we will be switching off, I believe. So every Sunday or so, you'll see me. Every Sunday or so, you'll see him. Uh, giving just a little bit of a, a key thought that you you should focus on from Mark's message and I don't know how much I'm pushing myself as the guy who manages the YouTube but uh, check the description down below we might be able to put those links in the description so that you can easily click onto them from here we got other things to announce yeah yep events events yes Women's retreat coming mm. up in September. You can That's still register. That's so soon. So soon. It's less mm -hmm. than a month away. I know. A couple days less than a month. Away. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can still register over on our Church Center app and our website, rabbitcreekchurch.org. And if you guys go check out the events page for the women's retreat, um, there's a post up right now. If you went to the women's retreat last year, um, it's just asking to share a fond memory you have of the women's retreat last year, so that the people who haven't gone on the women's retreat before kind of know know what to look for a little bit. Now, I know we lost a lot of the, the men when we started talking about women's retreat. Now, it is so important as men to be able to support your wives and your significant others to go on this. This is such a big trip, and I mean, I know my mom goes. I know your mom is planning on going or has yep. gone. Yep, she's so, planning on going. She's planning on going, so I know it's a big deal. Um, I've never been to one, if you really want to know what it looks like from a guy's perspective i guess you can ask josh but because um, <laughs> he went that was yeah, yeah he did um now to sign up for that it's as easy as going to our church center app right yep church center which app. i'm gonna put right here um now the church center app works for many different things it will say all in this tiny little mini commercial here but um for events that is probably the best way if not one of the only ways there are more ways and we're about to talk about those in a second <laughs> to get your information on events. Now, the best way to stay up to date, whether you're Hillside Campus, Huffman Campus, or online campus, and we love you so much, is to follow us on our Facebook page, follow us on our Instagram page, and check us out on our YouTube channel. Yeah. yeah. And all that being said, we're gonna have our uh, pastoral staff pop up on the screen after we head on out of here mm -hmm. um, with all their information so that you can get a hold of them throughout the week, and I don't think there's anything else. That we have to cover. Yeah. yeah. I think I about Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Oh, right. You know, that's my thing, isn't it? <laughs> uh, you students, yes. pay attention, and parents too. On Tuesday, this Tuesday, we're going to be starting back up with a hangout on Tuesday night at 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And it's going to be outside. We're going to be playing games, bring friends, bring, your, uh, bring yourselves, bring your family. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. And then on Wednesdays, school has started back up. Um, I'm starting tomorrow back at UAA, um, but we're going to have our study hangouts here at Bloom um, in the offices here from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. every Wednesday afternoon. You can come in, bring your books, get some studying in, um, get to see some people you like. Yeah, it's going to be a good time. Yeah, and there's going to be a dedicated study area that's going to be pretty well quiet so that you can just focus on your schoolwork. I know it's extremely important. I wish I would have known how important school was when I was in school, but that's a totally different story. Um, we'll have a hangout area where we can just relax and chill. And then there's going to be some rooms, if we can get a hold of them, 
um, that work around one of our local businesses uh, that you guys can do Zoom meetings and stuff like that. So come on in, bring your stuff, bring your books, bring your friends. There's going to be a lot of fun. All right. I think, I think that does it. I think it does. Yes. Well, on behalf of Rabbit Creek Church, we love you. We miss you. And we can't wait to see you soon. Uh, bye. That part always makes me so sad. I know. <laughs> <laughs>